Grace and peace to each of you on this Good Friday. Welcome to Imago Day. If you aren't normally with us on Sundays, I'm Tony, one of the pastors, and it's a great joy to have you uh, with us to reflect on uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. I know we have many uh, also live streaming us today, so wherever you're at today, uh, if you're with us, it's a joy to walk through John chapter 19 with you. Uh, we have been going through John's gospel for uh, a good amount of time, and so we're just uh, continuing that here on Friday. We'll be in John 20, Lord willing, uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, and so I just want to offer a prayer, and we'll, we'll have a look at this passage. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, you stand alone. You were in a class by yourself. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The resurrection and the life. The Son of Man, the Son of God. We worship you today. We magnify you today. We marvel at your grace. Marvel at your faithfulness. For all that you are and for all that you have done. We give you thanks this day. Apply your word to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Martin Luther, who we quote a time or two around here, once said that, I feel as though Jesus Christ died just yesterday. And I think when you read these final chapters of the Gospels, especially around the Easter season, you get a profound sense of the glory and gravity of the event. And every gospel writer, we have four gospels, and, and each gospel writer gives us a different lens through which to read of the story of Good Friday. Each of them are um, normally uh, presenting some theological uh, agenda that they're trying to advance. Last night we looked at Mark's gospel and how he really emphasized the suffering servant uh, in Jesus, his substitutionary death. We looked at the Last Supper in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I think John wants us to view the cross with three concepts in mind. So the sermon just has three words. Glory, sovereignty, and victory. Often people think that Good Friday services should be gloomy because of the agony that Jesus experienced. Emotional, yes. Serious, yes. But we're not to feel sorry for Jesus today. Jesus is okay. John doesn't even go into detail about the agony of Christ. If you notice, all he says in verse 18 is, they crucified him. Now, he has spoken briefly in chapter 12, verse 27, that Jesus was in agony as he pondered the, the cross. But as we mentioned last night, he doesn't include in the Garden of Gethsemane. And in his description of the crucifixion, John doesn't go into great detail about the nails in his hands and all of the suffering that Jesus uh, would have endured. Often you hear sermons on uh, Good Friday and about the crucifixion that really go into intricate detail as people try to get into the background of what was involved in a Roman crucifixion. And while it is, is good and it is right for us to consider the sufferings of Christ to be sure, we're looking at John's gospel. And what John wants us to not miss is that everything that happened on Good Friday happened according to prophecy. It happened according to the sovereign will of God. And it happened resulting in Jesus' glorious triumph. John has, as we say, a high Christology. His book opens unlike any of the other Gospels. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all through the Gospel, he's been giving us signs of Jesus' deity. In fact, we looked at seven of them in the first 11 chapters, from Jesus turning water into wine until the raising of Lazarus. John has given us those famous I am statements that also underscore the deity of Jesus. And he's repeatedly told us that Jesus is in charge all the way to the cross. As he said in John 10, 18, no one takes my life, I lay it down of my own authority. And we've been told that the hour hasn't come yet. It's not time yet. Until chapter 13, verse 1, the hour has come. And remarkably, Jesus has referred to his crucifixion as glory, the time of his glorification. We looked at that in chapter 17, verse 1. All of that to say, when we read the crucifixion, we need to 
read it understanding and, and bearing in mind the suffering to be sure, but we also read of the crucifixion bearing in mind that Jesus Christ is victorious. Jesus Christ has triumphed. Jesus has won. And all who are in him have won. And so we rejoice today in the glorious, sovereign, and victorious king. Now let me just summarize the passion narrative for you just in, in 12 brief bullet points. Just to remind you of these sorts of things. This is not part of the sermon. It's just for free. Um, I didn't know who would be here, so I just thought I would just be ready to go for a long time. Um, I'll edit on the fly. Don't worry. Um, Jesus and the disciples depart from the city for a location on the west side of the Mount of Olives. Now, all of the, uh, the, the four Gospels include these 12 events that I'm about to share with you. And then I'm going to show you what John doesn't include and what John alone includes. So that's number one. Secondly, Judas arrives with the crowd to take Jesus into custody. Jesus is examined by the high priest. That's Annas, who's sort of the emeritus high priest, and Caiaphas. And Jesus is examined by the Roman Pontius Pilate, or as Pastor Shane likes to call him, Pontius Pirate. Um, Pilate infers Jesus' innocence and offers to release one of his prisoners. The crowd then calls for Barabbas' release. Pilate gives the order of death for Jesus. Jesus is crucified with two men. The soldiers divide Jesus' clothes among themselves. Jesus is offered sour wine. Jesus dies, and Joseph of Arimathea requests his body. All four Gospels include those things. That's the basic story of the Passion. Now, what John does not include are these. These details. The betrayal with a kiss. The prayer in the garden. The sleepiness of the disciples. The healing of the servant's ear. Simon of Cyrene, who would carry the cross. The mocking crowds. And the cry of dereliction in, in, when he recites Psalm 22. One, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, when you look at the additions in John, what John includes that the other writers don't include, you get, you get a sense of what I'm describing, of the glory and the sovereignty and the victory of Jesus. These details underscore all of those things. So only John includes the Roman soldiers falling to the ground when Jesus identifies himself. Do you remember that? As he presents himself and they fall back on the ground. We noted his boldness and his sovereignty in that moment. Only John includes Jesus' conversation with Annas and his conversation with Pilate, which, by the way, was a big conversation about who the king is, right? Of Jesus saying, my, king is, my kingdom is not of this world. And, I would, and you would have no authority if it weren't given to you from above. We have John's emphasis on the inscription of the cross. It goes into more detail on that, which again is about kingship. A full description of Jesus' garments. Mary given to the beloved disciple at the cross. Only John includes those statements, I thirst and it is finished. That phrase, it is finished, has a cry of great victory. Only John includes Jesus' body uh, being threatened to be, to be broken, or, or his legs to, to be broken. Jesus is pierced with the soldier's lance. And only John includes Nicodemus reappearing, because only John included him in the first place. Now, all of that, you can see John's high Christology. He has a lofty view of Jesus Christ. He is presenting Jesus Christ as the reigning king who reigns from the cross. The place of shame has become the place of glory. His death has fulfilled prophecy, demonstrating the meticulous sovereignty of God. And his death is to be viewed as victory, as mission accomplished. So let's just ponder those three words for just a few moments this afternoon. Glory, sovereignty, and victory. Consider the glory. John has been showing us that the cross is actually a moment of Jesus' glorification. And so the shame of the cross has actually become the place of glory. We could ponder just a bit of the shame of it. At the end of verse 16, the text says, so they took Jesus. And again, John doesn't go into to detail about this, but this would have been the time in which they flogged Jesus. So he's now fully prepared for crucifixion having just endured this scourging. Many died from the scourging itself. You can imagine seeing Jesus. He would have bled profusely, his clothes soaked in blood, thorns piercing his head. Then John says, and he went out bearing his own cross. The vertical beam of the cross was normally kept on sight, 
the victim would carry the cross beam placed over his neck like a yoke. Jesus would carry his own cross for a while until he couldn't do it anymore. And we know from the other gospel writers that Simon of Cyrene would carry it. Those watching on the Via Della Rosa would have seen this horrific spectacle as they looked at Jesus as blood dropped all over the road. He carries his cross and he goes to the skull, which in Aramaic is Golgotha. We often sing about Calvary. That comes from the Latin word for skull, Calvaria. Take him there to Golgotha, to Calvary. Now this was a place that was public. It's not um, like we, uh, you hear sometimes in hymns on a hill far away. It was more like in the middle of a shopping mall today. It was public. And this was a time that was very populated. It's during Passover. This victim would have been crucified normally just above eye level, so you could see him right in the middle of everyone. And this is where they have put Jesus, where they have crucified him. And that's what John says in verse 18. Just a matter-of-fact statement. There, they crucified him. This death was reserved for the lowest of classes, slaves, criminals. No Roman could even be crucified without the emperor's sanction. The victim was normally crucified naked. The crucified one would die by means of suffocation or possibly a combination of exhaustion and suffocation. Eventually the person could no longer hold up his chest cavity. It would often last for hours. Sometimes it could even last for days. It was meant to bring about the most excruciating pain imaginable. Josephus, the historian, said of the crucifixion that it was the most wretched of all deaths. And Jesus is taken there and he's placed with two criminals. These are likely uh, terrorists, sort of guerrilla warfare soldiers who were trying to lead some kind of revolt. And we know from Isaiah 53 that it was also a fulfillment of a prophecy. So here is Jesus Christ on a cross the most wretched of all deaths, a place of horror and shame. Family members would often not even bury their relative who died by crucifixion because of such an honor and shame culture in which they lived. But we know this was the place of glory for our Lord. He finished his work by dying there, and he's reigning from the cross. F.F. Bruce, the New Testament scholar, says, quote, The crucified one is the true king, the kingliest king of all, because it is he who is stretched on the cross. He turns an obscene instrument of torture into a throne of glory and reigns from the tree. And now, my friends, he reigns from the throne, and he shall reign forever. He has swallowed up death forever by putting death to death in our place. Don Carson reflects on the irony and glory of the cross in this powerful poem. Listen to it and allow it to minister to your heart as it has mine. On that wretched day, the soldiers mocked him. Raucous laughter in a barracks room. Hell the king they sneered while spitting on him. Brutal beatings on this day of gloom. Though his crown was a thorn, he was born a king. Holy brilliance bathed in bleeding loss. All the soldiers blind to this stunning theme. Jesus reigning from a cross. Awful weakness marred the battered God-man, far too broken now to hoist the beam. Soldiers stripped him bare and pound the nails in. Watch him hang on the cruel tree. God's own temple down, he has been destroyed. Death's remains are laid in rock and sod, but the temple rises in God's wise ploy. Our great temple is the Son of God. Here's the one who says he cares for others, one who says he came to save the lost. How can we believe that he saves others? When he can't get off that bloody cross. Let him save himself, let him come down now, savage jeering at the king's disgrace. But by hanging there is precisely how Christ saves others as the King of grace. Draped in darkness, utterly rejected, crying, why have you forsaken me? Jesus bears God's wrath alone, dejected, weeps the bitterest tears 
instead of me. All the mockers cry, he has lost his trust. He's defeated by hypocrisy. But with faith's resolve, Jesus knows he must do God's will and swallow death for me. Praise God. Praise God. Well, that's the first word I give you. I've forgotten what it is by now, but you remember it, right? (laughs) Glory. This place of shame has become a place of glory. Second word is sovereignty. I want you to notice here in the events of John 19 how these events fulfilled Scripture. One writer has said, no fewer than 20 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled within 24 hours of the crucifixion. No fewer than 20. Things were not out of control. And by the way, that's one view of Jesus that's espoused by a professor not far from here, that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet who thought the end of the world was coming and basically the wheels fell off at the end and he was a false prophet. He died shocked by dying on a cross and was a disillusioned failure. Nothing could be further from the truth. Things were not out of control. Quite the contrary, in God's mysterious sovereignty, these events happened just as they were foretold. This is what Peter said in his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2. Now, as you look at the the people in this story, and I'm going to run through them quickly, you notice by what they say or by what they do how these events fulfill scripture. Sometimes John just explicitly tells us this fulfilled scripture. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes you just have to see the irony and know more of the big story to see it. But John wants us to see here that God is in control. And so we read first in Pilate, what he writes is more than Pilate even knew. Right? Pilate wrote an inscription, put it on a cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now this This is a bit of revenge from Pilate. Pilate was a weak king, and he had been at odds with the Jews, uh, as you recall from the previous verses, and he even taunted them. And now he's continuing to mock the Jews by calling Jesus king of the Jews. But he, he spoke better than he knew. It was written, verse 20, in three major languages of the Mediterranean, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, so everyone could read it which is also somewhat illustrative of the fact that Jesus is a global king. He's not merely king of the Jews. Verse 21, So the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Instead of seeing Jesus hanging there as their savior and long-awaited Messiah, uh, they, they gripe about an editorial note. They, they want to make some corrections. And Pilate answered them, what I have written, I have written. So Pilate won't change it. He's a weak king. He's a stubborn king. And he has been at odds. And through all of these, all of this interaction with Pilate and the Jews, he actually said something that's absolutely true. That the one who is being mocked as king is the king. So it's it's wonderful irony. Now notice the soldiers' words. You move from Pilate's words to the soldiers' words, and this too is a fulfillment of Scripture. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them in four parts, one part for each soldier. This was customary uh, during uh, crucifixions of soldiers doing these sorts of things. The tunic, John says, was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom, which means it was valuable. And so... That one they don't want to tear, verse 24, but instead they want to cast lots. And John just tells us this fulfilled scripture. (laughs) I mean, what intricate detail that, as he cites here, uh, the text, Psalm 22, verse 18, which is echoed many times around the crucifixion, that great Psalm 22. They divided my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast lots. And John says, so the soldiers did these things. So Pilate's inscription, king of the Jews, the soldiers gambling for or rolling the dice for his clothing is happening according to God's wise plan of salvation. Now the third category is Jesus' words. Jesus utters three words from the cross in John's gospel. There are seven words overall when you look at the four gospels that we often uh, emphasize. But there are three here and they are reserved only here in the pages of John's gospel. The first one is regarding his mother, and then the second and third are somewhat connected. I thirst and I finish. So statement one, 
Woman, behold your son. And then he looks to John and says, behold your mother. Now there's something very tender about this, these verses. Notice what, G, what John says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So four ladies, and three of them Mary, a lot of Marys at the cross. <laughs> and when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is how John refers to himself, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. So even at Jesus' most agonizing moment, he's still thinking of others. And in this case, it's his mother. Mary would have been about 50. His brothers are likely not present, according to John 7, 5. They don't believe until the resurrection. And you can imagine the pain this would have brought to Mary. Most of us in this room, I would imagine, can relate to this special bond that a mother has with her child. I know my kids gravitate to their mother. If they don't see her, it's where is mama? I'm like, what am I, chop suey? <laughs> At night they all go, you know, five kids on her side of the bed and nobody over here with me. Even the dogs with her. I'm not bitter, but that's just how it works. <laughs> you know what it's like? Some of you, my mother's watching my live stream today. She's texted me multiple times today. Oh, I thank God for her. If you carry a child, there's a special bond. You imagine Mary with all those prophecies about her pregnancy. All the drama of Luke 1 and 2. She treasured these things in her heart. And you remember there was a prophecy in Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and 35, Simeon regarding uh, Mary, that a sword would pierce your heart. Something is going to happen to you that's going to be so painful. And she doesn't know when that's going to be. She doesn't know how it's going to be. And here it is. As she is looking on the execution of her son. Can you imagine a mother watching her son being executed? And so Jesus is obviously here thinking of his mother. He's honoring his mother. He's ensuring the care of his mother. And so he makes sure in this moment, John, you see to it that you take care of her and you can consider her as mother. But there's something else going on, I think. While he tells John this is mother, what he first says to his mother is actually what he said in John chapter 2. Woman. Remember that? When Mary comes and says to Jesus at the wedding, uh, they have no wine. You need to do something about it. And Jesus looks to her and essentially says, it's none of your business what I'm doing. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Which would have been really hard to hear for a mother, right? And we remember what was going on in this moment. It was more than a wedding party happening. This was the first of seven signs. And so while Jesus is the son of Mary, he is also the son of God. And he occupies a unique relationship with Mary, doesn't he? In another occasion, they come to get Jesus and he says, uh, your, your brothers and, and mother is coming to look for you. And he says, my brothers and my mother are those who do the will of God. So what does Jesus say? What does he, does he mean anything? I think, I think he does. When he is calling Mary mother, or excuse me, woman, it's an echo of the garden. You remember the ancient promise, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's going to come one through the seed of woman who's going to crush the head of the serpent. And we're waiting on that one to come. And then Paul says in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of woman born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. And in this moment, the time has come for Jesus Christ to crush the head of the serpent. This is an ancient promise fulfilled in this moment. He's the victor. Well, that's statement number one. Statement number two says John took her to his home. After this, Jesus, knowing that it was all now finished, he said to fulfill scripture, I thirst. This was to 
uh, verse 29, a jar of sour wine stood there, and so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. This was to increase the suffering. Uh, this is not the, the wine mixed with myrrh that you read about in Mark. There's no compassion here. This also fulfills scripture, as John tells us, Psalm 69, verse 21. The hyssop branch might be an allusion back to the Passover, which was the brush that you put the lamb's blood over your door. Here is Jesus in agony. I thirst. This too fulfills scripture. Well, this last statement I'll come back to in a moment. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. One word in Greek, to tell us die. It's not so much a cry of relief as much as it is a cry of victory. He's not saying, I, I'm glad it's over, though I'm sure Jesus was glad it was over, but it's accomplished. It's finished. It's done. You remember John 17, 4, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work you gave me to do. That's what's going on here. And then John tells us he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Even in the last moment of Jesus' life here on the cross, he is the one giving up his spirit. He is the one who is laying down his life of his own authority. Well, that is Jesus' words. Now, let me just briefly just hit the, the last two paragraphs so we can be ready for Sunday. Jew, the Jews' words. They come and also fulfill Scripture unknowingly. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So they didn't want a crucified person hanging on the Sabbath. That was impure. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. So the, the two criminals on the cross had their legs broken. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And so the, the, the emphasis here is that he was really dead. And by the way, that was a, a common heresy in John's day, that Jesus wasn't fully human, and therefore he didn't really die. Well, John's going into great detail here to tell us that Jesus was dead. They didn't break his legs, and a soldier even pierced this lance into his side, and there came out blood and water. John says, I was there, verse 35. He who saw it is born witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. And notice I love this little piece in, in this story. John adds his purpose clause right in the middle of the crucifixion. <laughs> Let me remind you guys of why I'm writing, that you also may believe. So what do you do with all this information? Believe. Believe. For these things took place according to the Scripture, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, rather, that not one of his bones will be broken. This is a combination of Exodus 12, 46 and Numbers 9, 12. And then one other fulfillment scripture, Psalm 34, verse 20. They will look on him in whom they have pierced. Oh, excuse me, that's Zechariah uh, 12, verse 10. The other, uh, not one of his bones are broken. It's Psalm 34, 20. So here again is another case in great detail that Jesus is fulfilling scripture. Final words, Joseph's words. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. So Joseph is a wealthy man. He's a disciple of Jesus, we're told. He's in a, he's in a difficult position. Nicodemus also, who had early come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. This, this is a remarkable amount of spices used. It's reminiscent of the massive amount of wine at the wedding. These spices were a symbol of honor. It's like the burial of a king. And he's placed in a tomb of honor, one that had never been used, John tells us. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. John doesn't state it, but Isaiah 53 verse 9 says, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, like the two men beside him, but what happened? Well, you see here, Joseph asked for the body, and it turns out that Jesus is given a rich man's tomb instead. 
All of this to say, my friends, you can trust God. You can trust his word. Not one word has ever failed. We've looked at glory. We've considered sovereignty. Finally, a brief word, victory. The man on the cross was actually a victor and not a victim. This point is simply a reflection on those words, it is finished. And it's a reflection on how John 19 ends. There's anticipation. They laid Jesus there. Mary Magdalene will come to the tomb early in the morning. Jesus' cry on the cross proclaimed his triumph and his resurrection would prove it. It is finished. You need the whole Bible to really understand that phrase. Spurgeon once said of this word to telestai, it would take every word that was ever spoken or ever will be spoken to fully explain that one word. It is finished. Jesus is saying more than what most people heard on that day. They're hearing, I'm glad this is done. What he's saying is full and final atonement has been made. Jesus won. And all who are in, in him have won. And he won by dying. And the resurrection would prove it. The resurrection is the Father's amen to the Son's it is finished. So we rejoice today. Christ Jesus has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. One writer put it well. His victory is the basis for our security. My confidence in God and the assurance of my salvation cannot be anchored in my religious performance. It is finished. What was needed to satisfy God ought to satisfy us as well. This is the good news of the gospel. And my friends, if you're not a believer and you're here with us today, this is the message we hold out to you. It is finished. Every other religion is saying, do. Do this and do this. And the gospel says, it is done. Trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. As the hymn puts it, lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet, and stand in him and him alone, gloriously complete. And if you are a Christian today, rest in him, rejoice in him, rest in this one who took your place, rejoice in this one who triumphed over your enemies through his death and resurrection, and let's tell this good news to the whole world. The good news that you can receive salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in this Christ alone. Why don't we pray and let's sing a song of triumph together. Father, we thank you for your word today. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I pray you would grant faith to some today. Whether they're in this room or they're watching online. You give them eyes to see the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. May we never lose the wonder of Golgotha. May we never lose sight of our triumphant King who reigned from a cross on that Friday and now reigns on a throne and will reign forever. Lord Jesus, we sing this song to you. It is finished with great joy and great hope and profound gratitude. Receive our praises, we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said.